<laughs> yeah, well, it, it kind of deflates that while I can just <laughs> deafen myself. No, no, you can't. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just, just, giving a, just I, giving my nice mic a handy. Hmm. I feel like Howard Stern. I don't really like it, other than I, we're both Jewish we've boys. Got, we've got we've got Liam in the studio here to ride the Sibian. Hey, that's right. Oh my God. Uh, Joe, you know, I was reading about how, uh, what's this thing called phrenology? <laughs> Joe Rogan just nods along sagely. <laughs> you put Joe Rogan and Howard Stern in the same room together. I like to think that all Howie would be able to just kick his ass, but I know that should all he did all Joe Joe Rogan ever did was host Fear Factor, right? Like mm-hmm. that's why he's, he's also so popular. an MMA guy. I, uh, play a real sport. I'd, play football. Pick up a football. Never listened to the Joe Rogan podcast. I, I just uh, although is it if, good? I don't no, I don't know. I've never listened to it. I listened to like two minutes of the Elon Musk one, and then. Uh, I had to be taken down because I started to, to frankly do uh, Google searches for putting revolver in one's own mouth. <laughs> Much more complicated than it used to be. In addition to uh, vicenews.com, get at me. Uh, if Spotify wants to give me a quarter of a million dollars to do this dumb bullshit, uh, get at me there, too. Hmm. They'll, they'll give you a quarter to do this dumb no, bullshit. I will, no, they have to give me... <laughs> you two can do whatever the hell you want. Uh, this podcast is now Liam and the Liamettes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Why do I have to twirl right. this baton? What am I doing? <laughs> Why is it on fire? Yo, fire batons are fucked up, dude. Mm. Like, I remember... Uh, my neighbor used to do fire baton and it was a shit because she was the perfect kid and I was always just waiting for her to burn down her parents rancher and they never sort of did that it was always a bummer mm-hmm. god damn it I know buddy yeah I know right um all right so we are we, we the Zencaster is going right yes uh, this, okay yeah, yeah so everything's I, going yeah. we, we got I'm, everything I'm, I'm recording uh all right. is the oh shit I, uh, let me fire up Audacity, sorry. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm oh good. No, I'm good now. Can three adults do a podcast? Probably Let's find not. Out. No, mm. no, almost certainly no. Um, <laughs> all right, well, if we're here, since we got a time limit, uh, welcome to where... Well, welcome to... Well, <laughs> well, welcome to where... Well, 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 I've been well, drinking well, since well, 9 a.m. Well, uh, yeah, my yeah, name is Justin Rossi. I can all kill you, bitch. <laughs> We're all ready to be the uh, the fire chiefs of a small town in Ohio. <laughs> I know, right? Rocky welcome River, to get well, at there's, me. Welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters. It has slides. I understand some people are having difficulty finding the slides. Uh, if you're uh, listening audio only, they're in the description. You nincompoops. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who is talking right now. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Hmm. Okay. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I am the person who is talking now. My pronouns, once again, truly are she and her. Not a bit. My name Not is bit. Liam Anderson. No. My pronouns are he and him. And we have shirts now and a sticker. Holy uh, shit. I, I, we I, have I know. merch. We have merch, ladies, gentlemen, and non binary pals. Give us all your goddamn money. All of it. Every last goddamn dime. <laughs> Make your parents kill your roommate. Take their money. Buy our merch, please. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Liam needs your help against the five over ones, but in order to yeah. do it, he needs the number on your credit card, the three numbers on the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's welcome to well, there's your problem. Live from uh the state correctional facility. In Al- <laughs> you can send us the uh, last four digits of your social security number. That's also a good idea. Uh, you know. for verification you know maybe a photocopy or a passport maybe your actual passport yeah, actually. actually just give us your passports <laughs> yeah just give us your passport <laughs> uh, ignore ignore my uh ignore my saudi bin laden badge um, <laughs> <laughs> um anyway so what you're looking at in this slide is a i believe in, in the time period they would have called this a conflagration mm. isn't it conflagration Oh, who cares? Who remembers? Make dumb fire. Yeah. Well, this yeah. is not. This is not supposed to. It's a far. A far. That's a good Maryland shit. 
<laughs> Why are people? I like the the people in foreground who are just trudging away from the fire. Yeah, well, you not would. Yeah, you just resigned. Just like, Let's fucking go. This is the yeah. worst fucking day. No, I they, wanted they, to they, go, they, I they, to they go achieved. To mall. <laughs> yeah, no. They, what they did was they internalized the share zone post. That's like you can just leave you anything. Just leave. <laughs> See, scene of a disaster. You can just walk out if you're fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> just go well, home. Yeah. Now there, there's supposed to be a bridge here, huh. but oh, it's there. you it's may just on the notice <laughs> that that's a bad bridge that I drew. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah but there's some fire yeah, on where the bridge yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, there's some fire below where the bridge used to be, and that's on account of a train went over it and the bridge collapsed and then caught fire. Oh boy. Um, yeah, so today we're talking about the Ashtabula Horror. That, they had a such cooler way of naming these things in the 19th century. Like, I was that is a to spooky say, yeah, ass name for right. a regular train crash to be like the Ashtabula horror. horror. Yeah, that's yes, like horror. B- blood coming out of the locomotive firebox kind of vibe. Oh, yeah, you got like the big skull face on the front of the locomotive. Yeah. Like so, that, uh, so I see you. Face? You too have King seen book? Final Destination. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, and then the rails turned red <laughs> with blood. <laughs> There's like you're trying, you're trying to try to tell a scary story as you're cr- uh, careening over a bridge by cold box light. That's right. That's better than that's better than them turning red with rust. I, I will say yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, the blood uh, lubricates. We've been over this with yeah. horse viscera. Although blood can blood contains iron, so I don't. You you don't you don't want the uh, you, you don't want the rails lubricated. That's a bad it's a bad sign. <laughs> that's how you get slippery. <laughs> no, rail make, makes you go faster. Look, build things out of more rigid, more strong things, and lubricate the rails of railroads constantly. Oh, you're going to like this episode, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we have to do the goddamn news. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Uh, ah, no. No. Fuck, no, that's still all of the... F- <laughs> that's Halloween! <laughs> Damn it! It's just <laughs> Where the, Where's my oh, fucking my. news? <laughs> Thank you. There, there's your right. goddamn there we, news. There we go. There we go. There's a big car crash at the Bahrain Grand Prix, right? It's Bahrain. Mm-hmm. The most right? ethical Grand Prix in the season. I don't know. I think Baku is a uh, yeah. strong contender now for most <laughs> ethical. Um, did they do Baku this year? I don't know. Um, I don't I think know so. either. Mm. Well, anyway, this happened. Yeah. Ro- Rona- R- Roman. Is it Roman? Yeah. Roman Grosjean. Yeah. Yeah, he he crashed, and the car exploded in a fireball, and he walked away totally is, unhurt. Hey, sometimes know, right? safety systems just work, as we learned in Lake Pinier. Yeah, yeah. He, it sheared the front half off of the Jesus car. Jesus, uh, like if you look at it, it has physically it had lost half of its length. The front half, like right where yeah. the dude's legs are, and no, he's fine. No, he's <laughs> fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, a testament to the safety of modern race cars compared to, you know, our Group B episode mm. available on our Patreon. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. reading, I was reading um, Professor Sid Watkins book. He was the, uh, the in-house surgeon for Formula One for a long time. And like, he, he just kind of writes it up like, yeah, in the old days, I, I tried to set up a medical car and uh, told them to pick up all the empty beer cans from the floor of the medical center, and they just told me to go fuck myself. So <laughs> th- things have changed somewhat since the 70s, and uh, all hey, for the better. Yeah, I was about to say, hey, I'm Sid Watkins, this is my Glenn. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sid Watkins, and this is Jackass. <laughs> oh my god. Um, we got two. We got two car-related newses today. Yeah, what's been pissing um, you off this morning, Roz? <laughs> oh my god. This has been incredible. I've never seen someone get dunked on so hard on Twitter. This is the main this is the main guy of Twitter today. A man has learned how to use the traffic visualization software VizSim and demonstrated how the Las Vegas loop will work. And uh, 
it, it looks like a, 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 a like a taxi stand at like a second rate Indian airport. <laughs> yeah. He what does That's he think true. this is going to work well? I I mean if you look at the animation it's it's incredible just how chaotic it is and how it looks like it, it, just vehicles cracking into bit, each other constantly. Bit chaotic and like 17 it, pedestrians die in the simulation. I know, right? I I was just uh, amazed that like there are there seems to be a minority of people who are like, well, he did it in VizSim, it must work in real life. And this is sort of an intersection of you know our traffic engineering episode and the loop episode. These these so the software like VizSim is basically designed so after you do the hard design work, you can go in and sort of justify it post uh, facto and say, look how well it'll work because <laughs> you can just adjust the parameters until it looks like it's working well. Or you build it in real life and it's shit. I will say, I will say the Elon Musk uh, fans are are basically shitting their pants over this. And it's just like, oh, you're just Elon haters. And it's like, this shit just doesn't isn't going to work. Like, I, too, could play along with VizSim long enough to make it look good. Uh, and, and I wouldn't murder pedestrians in the process. That's a well, there's your problem promise. I, I, I saw a guy on Twitter who had the most fascinating bio, which was, I like Elon Musk and Bernie. Get over it. And I'm just like, okay. Sir, sir uh, so what, uh, what are your politics? Hero Explain. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess so. He's uh, also uh, Yang, the one guy was in this denial. Guy, this guy specifically was being shitty to, uh, or one of the guys he tagged was being shitty to a friend of the pod, Gareth Dennis. Just <laughs> want to say, uh, we love Gareth Dennis, and he's right yes. about HS2. Fuck you. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I'm just, I was just fascinated at the amount of effort people were going into to dunk on this guy. You see 803 quote tweets down here at the bottom, and I looked through a bunch of them. Every single one was just people dunking on the guy. Uh, <laughs> no, not even, you know things are bad when you can't even get the quote tweets that are just like, some guy in a suit with his real name going like, interesting. I'll, I'll link the video in the description so you can see just how ludicrous this, uh, this simulation is. It's, it's, it's just... Look, it works if you, you turn can't. clipping for pedestrians off. <laughs> Why didn't anyone think of that? Vision Zero would be so easy then if you could just turn no clip on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the cheat code for that is. Uh, anyway, now to like go the to sound the sound of all three of us trying to come up with a punchline for that and then it's just not going. It's a punchline, exactly it's like just no. fucking depressing. It's so depressing to watch these people be, think that my arguments against uh, murdering 17 pedestrians at a Viz Sim uh, thing <laughs> are just anti-Elon hate. Like, listen, I love apartheid emerald mining as much as the next guy. Uh, <laughs> PayPal is a good and useful service. And like, dude, I don't, I just, I don't understand why our entire existence has to be reduced to like fandom and standing yeah. culture look and the most like, relatable why can't thing i just criticize elon musk like yeah. yeah i'm sure the guy would be fun to have one beer with maybe yeah. i also think george w bush would be fun to have one beer with maybe he's a better guy's drinker a fun, that's for sure you just gotta take his keys like, yeah like, yeah just bush because, is probably like, better at drinking than elon musk molding your personalities around your favorite celebrities I mean, look all the, these the people only, don't, the most I'm relatable all God these damn people you, the most the relatable thing that Elon Musk did ever did was thing. when he got his PayPal money, he got like hair plugs, right? And he will block he? you for pointing that shit out. If you send him the photo of him balding with a hairline halfway up his head, kind of like mine, he will block you even though it's the only good thing he's ever done was fixing that. Yeah, but you're pretty and I like you. And you help <laughs> oh, me make you. money. No, also uh, true. Yes. Right. So before well, I technically was really so does Elon <laughs> since we like work through PayPal. Uh, well, as this is a good goes, point. Yeah. Shit, yeah right. Well, well, they they uh, they, they kicked uh, <laughs> Elon out of PayPal because he was fucking it up so bad. Us. <laughs> oh, they're also owned by yeah. PayPal. Yeah. I just wow. I, I this fucking stand culture and everyone's just like, man, the Kardashians went to a private island. LOL, Elon, you're so rad, and I'm just like, this. Listen, listen again. It will be good when Elon Musk goes to Mars, and hopefully we can just cut the comm link when he's halfway up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that is the goddamn news. Car continues to be bad. Mm. Uh, 
this is the most petrifying bridge I've ever seen in my life. I do not like any of this. Oh, oh, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. Early, Don't be a baby. Yeah, no, early I, railroad I infrastructure like was a little lightly built. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, lightweight, more gooder. Yeah, exactly. So I thought we'd start with some context for early railroad engineering, right? So uh, let's 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 start here. Start real basic. What what? Why is it called? Why is the profession called civil engineering? Because you don't have to salute anybody. Oh, well, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, c- civil engineering was uh, to distinguish it from military engineering, right? Um, and sort of in the early American uh, Republic, sort of the antebellum era, where you know you were building some of the early railroads, your typical career track, if you were you were going to go work for the railroad, was as an engineer. You would first go to West Point, right? Mm. You'd get your military education there. You'd get your commission, and then you'd you 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 would serve as an officer for six months, and then you would resign, and then you would go work for the railroad, <laughs> which is much more much more uh, profitable. The noble American tradition of like exploiting the military to gain a uh, quick education, you know, from that day to this, it's it's still a thing, and and God bless it. Yeah, I, I went to work for the private sector because I'm not a moron. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, you know, then, then uh, all right, so a lot of these early railroads, they're sort of based on canal practices to start start with, right? So you know, we put the, the locomotive through a series of locks to change its, uh, change its elevation. Way, hey, up oh, she rises. You're not... You're not so wrong there. No. Um, what? Yeah, no. so you would you would have um basically flat track that would, where the train would be hauled by a locomotive and then every once in a while you'd get to an inclined plane, right? Where you would have ropes hauling the train up and down a steep hill and then you'd attach it to a locomotive, you'd keep going flat for a while. Yeah, Roz and I actually saw uh parts of this out near where were we? Johnstown and uh, Columbia. Uh, it was uh, Galatson. Galatson, thank you. Yeah, one of the uh, the main line of public works uh, inclined planes. Um, yeah, it was it was a hell of a climb. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was not pleasant. Yeah. Uh, spoilers for Franklin Thirteen, which will be coming out after Franklin Twelve, which will be coming out at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. As your locomotives get more powerful, they start to th- say, hey, maybe we can just get rid of these inclined planes. Maybe the train can just go up the hill, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, this leads to, by the 1850s, we start to see the trunk lines being built. And um, so we have, for instance, here's the, you, to start out with, you had four major eastern trunk lines, right? So you had the Pennsylvania Railroad. It went from Philadelphia. It went over the Alleghenies winding route to Pittsburgh, right? That's where it ended to start out with. You had the Baltimore and Ohio. It went from Baltimore, sort of winded through West Virginia and Virginia. Well, it, West Virginia was just Virginia when this was built. It went out to meet the Ohio River at Wheeling. The main thing was to hit the Ohio River or the Great Lakes. Just uh, load stuff t- onto paddle boats or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, more likely canal boats or... Mm. Um, really sailboats even at that point. Um, you know, so you had the Erie as well, went from Jersey city. It went through the Southern tier in New York to a port called Dunkirk. Right. Uh, you had the New York, New York central, which went sort of North along the Hudson river and went through Albany, Schenectady, Utica, Utica, a bunch of other places went to Buffalo. Right. Um, so, you know, these were mostly intrastate railroads um you know and again they they, is to reach especially the grain trade out west which uh they didn't quite get initially because the erie canal really monopolized that to start out with um so they entirely different future where you have canal barons instead of railroad barons oh yeah well the canals were mostly publicly owned oh uh, that's and so they had to be destroyed which we'll get into the publicly owned railroads were a disaster. Um, I don't know if I can get into that. That's a little complex <laughs> as to 
just how badly these these publicly owned railroads were run. Um, well, I guess the main thing is they were open access, right? So if you had if you had your own locomotive, you could run it on the railroad. <laughs> that's Posting the like town. uncap grinning uh, <laughs> ball meme here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people did not have their own locomotive, so instead they had their own horse, and that screwed up any fast services. So, uh, initially, like, your charters for these railroads really didn't allow them to own anything outside of certain rights of way or certain states, right? So, in order to expand west from, say, Pittsburgh or Wheeling or any of these places, rather than being able to own track outright, you need this sort of big complex network of holding companies, leases, and, you know, sort of private capital from the owner of the railroad and, you know, some of the major stockholders, which sort of tenuously held collections of nominally independent railroads into a vaguely coherent system, right? Um, You know, and these associated railroads are owned by shady individuals. They have crappy finances. They have Badly maintained physical plant. Are you suggesting you that there's some corruption involved hey. here, Ross? Oh, in, a, in, a, in a twirling mustache like dystopia with Elon yeah. Musk's, this is the side that didn't run the apartheid emerald mine. Uh, people are mad at me on Twitter, so I just want to say uh, while we're here, suck a dick. Uh, <laughs> and also, like, I just, I do love reading about like the, the alphabet soup era and just like yeah nothing worked and everyone's corrupt and the stock certs didn't work and the and the rails yeah. fell apart but like yeah look how look at the holding companies look how many of them there are well the yeah, thing as, is as, like tr- the thing is that like trains appeal to someone with a mind for like collecting a lot of minutiae and uh, the oh, more no. minutiae the better and so you have all of these cool companies and they have cool liveries and you can just remember all of them that rocks i uh, know uh, everything was the uh, locomotives were painted black and no. the i, I no longer like this box car red yeah i know right no this is sort of as liam said the sort of alphabet soup era of railroading and sort of the antebellum period right if you read a history of railroads from this era the author just sort of throws they they like mention these various railroads and they just throw acronyms at you for like, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs and you have no idea what he's talking about because you need, you know, four railroads to go from two between two major cities, which are a hundred miles apart. Right. So, you know, we're going to talk about one such railroad today, which is the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern railroad, which itself was a collection of dozens of other railroads. Um, so in the 1840s, after these trunk lines had been completed, uh, men aspired to a singular and noble but nigh unattainable goal, which was building a railroad from Cleveland, Ohio, to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> JFK voice. We, you know, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> <laughs> we chose to go to Buffalo in this decade and do the other things. <laughs> <laughs> and some guy's just like, I oh, fucking Buffalo. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want to go there. All right. So how, how do we get a railroad from Buffalo to Cleveland? Which is more inhospitable to human life? The, the Earth's moon or Buffalo? Uh, I've been to Buffalo. I didn't die. I've never been to I the like moon. Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. So we need four railroads to do this, right? Number one is the Buffalo and State Line Railroad. Okay, so this was chartered in 1849. And to start out, it built the line from Dunkirk to the Pennsylvania State Line, right? Then the rest of the railroad opened in 1852. Uh, One month later than the first section that went from Dunkirk to Buffalo. This was built to six foot Erie gauge, right? That's what the green railroads I'm going to put down are Erie gauge. I guess the Erie here should also be green. Um, Now, from here, we have to charter another railroad. This is in the state of, this is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Erie and Northeast Railroad, right? Yeah. So get off the first train, change to this train. Yeah. Well, no, because this is also built to Erie gauge. Going from Erie to the town of Northeast and to the New York state line right here. Okay. 
That was chartered 1842, opened January 1852, also a six-foot Erie gauge. Now, to go further, we have to... I'm switching to blue now. Hey, Roz? Yeah? Do you want to... Or I can make the point uh, that... Was was standard gauge around at this time, or is it somewhat important that the Erie gauge was sort of existing in its own ecosystem, thereby making... I don't know if that's important right now in the history, but interoperability not being possible because standard versus Erie. Oh, that's a major, major, major thing, which we'll get to in the next slide. Oh, just okay, how, my bad. My how, bad, my bad. How important these, these next these gauges are, right? Okay. So one of the things you do as a town, um, if you want to preserve your access to commerce, is you mandate a gauge change in your town. We'll get to that. And Erie was one such town which mandated that, right? So. From here, the Franklin Canal Company, hey, which was chartered to build a canal somewhere down here-ish, right? Um, actually, instead, built a railroad from Erie to <laughs> it's the Ohio line. technically in spec. We have built, <laughs> yeah. like, fuck you. It's, it, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Same state. What do you care? No one lives out yeah. here anyway. <laughs> and this was if, built- if I were a right-wing hack, this is where I would do the, uh, I actually identify as a canal joke. <laughs> <laughs> so this was built from Erie, Pennsylvania to the Ohio state line at four foot 10 inch Ohio gauge, right? And from there, a, a, a fourth railroad was chartered. The Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula Railroad. This is the one we're going to talk about most today. To go from Cleveland to the Pennsylvania state line, right? Also, four foot, 10 inch Ohio gauge, right? So, by 1852, this impossible task linking Cleveland with Buffalo was achieved with, with only four railroads and only one break of gauge. <laughs> All right, so where do we go from here? What is a break of gauge? What is a break of gauge? Track gauge is the distance between the rails, right? So we see here, this is dual gauge track, um, which is uh, built uh, to seven foot Brunel gauge and four foot eight and a half inch standard gauge, right? Um, That we see in this one slide. Um, so the distance between the rails, you know, basically forces you to use some rolling stock as opposed to others. Like railroads can't interoperate if they're different gauges, or they sort of can, but you need really complex equipment to do so, right? Um, which is why today in the United States, in Europe, in most of the world, uh, we have the nice, even standard gauge. Yeah, and it's why Russia <laughs> doesn't, is because it's terrified of being invaded by railroad. We talked about this on a mm-hmm. previous episode. Yes. And that's, uh, again, nice, even four foot, eight and a half inches, very sensible measurement, right? Yeah. Well, if, well, if only we had Brunel gauge. Brunel gauge, we call it <laughs> Brunel, the Brunel gauge <laughs> one of these megalomaniac projects where you just like, what if, what if we built the train 18 feet wide? Yeah, yeah what exactly. If every, what if every train car was a railway gun? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the antebellum period, you know, before oh, the Civil War, um, there were many, many railroad gauges, right? Um, so in the South, you'd build the five foot, the Erie built a six foot. Some, uh, the B&O was standard gauge, four foot, eight and a half inches. The Pennsylvania Railroad was four foot, nine inches. Most of Ohio was four foot, 10 inches, and there were half a dozen other gauges. Um, and you might ask, well, why don't we standardize on one? And, you know, one of the things is no one knows which one is best yet. And the other one's local politics, right? So towns wanted the commerce associated with break of gauge, right? That's when you have to unload everyone from one passenger car and load them onto the next one. Maybe we'll stop and get a bite to eat. You got to transfer all the freight. You got to do a whole bunch of bullshit. So you're, so you're breeze wooding them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> so, see, seen here that's on the exactly left. exactly what it is. Yeah. Where everyone looks very relaxed and like they're about to buy something. Yes, exactly. This kind of looks like the massacre of the innocents, actually. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I, I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> so, 
Okay, uh, so these towns, since they had a lot of influence in railroad charters, they would mandate certain railroads use certain gauges and make sure that none of the railroads that came into town were using the same one. So, and a good example of this is the town of Erie, Pennsylvania, where things got a little out of hand at some point. Oh boy, I love to hear yeah. about when things get a little out of hand. Yes, so we got to talk about the Erie Gauge War. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. December 7th, 1853, right? Uh, a date infamous in history. <laughs> um, the citizens in the town of Erie hear of this nefarious plot by the Erie and Northeast Railroad and the Buffalo and State Line Railroads. That's the line from Erie to Buffalo, right? To convert their railroads from Erie Gauge to Ohio Gauge, right? But then the trains will be able to just blast straight through and nobody will Ex stop to buy our crap. Yeah, exactly. Right. There was uh there's there's real concern that the uh the peanut salesman in Erie would be out of a job. Um <laughs> I feed my family was. selling people this crap. <laughs> <laughs> so the mayor of Erie swears in a hundred and fifty special police constables. Oh boy. <laughs> and he leads them in destroying railroad track and infrastructure behind the railroad crews who are switching the gauge. <laughs> I mean, of the things that an 1850s mayor could swear in a, a, like a mob of angry townsfolk to do, this is among the less evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just some light vandalism. Yeah, se seven miles away in the town of Harbor Creek, uh, the townsfolks actually you know, tore down a railroad bridge yeah, that's where they invented Harbor Phrase. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So on December 27th, the train of railroad officials arrives at the town of Harbor Creek, where this, this conflict was still raging. And one of these railroad officials decides they need to shoot into the crowd <laughs> assembled to yeah. protest the gauge change. Classic Pinkerton shit. <laughs> they I got know, bonus right? Army. Oh my goodness! They got um, they got uh, they I I he, he didn't actually hit anyone. It was probably with like I don't know some also some classic Pinkerton yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, probably some like puny like eighteen fifties like elaborately engraved pistol of some mm. kind. You know, I have a so the, one round a minute. <laughs> Uh, after the shot rings out, the engineer of the train is like, "We got to get the fuck out of here." So he he, he goes full <laughs> throttle the for the state line. Child locks down on the train. <laughs> you just hear just the locks go like, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> "We're in a bad part of town." Just the GTA theme music starts playing. Conductor just takes one of those whatever eight foot rifles they used during the revolution. <laughs> Can't even fucking aim it. <laughs> just like, I'll show you a fucking drive by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all played Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> yeah, despite this, the crowd managed to force its way onto the train. At least four or five people Did got on. Did not go fast enough. <laughs> yeah, at this point, but once once they were on, they there were only four or five of them. They're like, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> kind of <laughs> takes the fight out of the whole angry mob thing. I know, right? When suddenly you don't have the angry mob to back you up anymore, you're suddenly feeling a little little bit a little bit lonely <laughs> and the train the train just hightailed it for the new york state line where uh new york uh state police i don't know what the equivalent was back then they go on the train and they they take the stowaways off and they They're deport them back up. to pennsylvania <laughs> might even yeah. have still been the original new york state police complete with the like God. fascist uniforms who knows god damn new yorkers <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we could come and invade Philly and drive your real estate prices up, but when you guys want to stow aboard a train, listen, I am sympathetic <laughs> to the train hijackers. I want to rob yeah. a train. <laughs> so by February 1st, 1854, the, the, the conflicts kind of settled down. They finally settle. They finally managed to change the gauges of the railroad, but random violence and property damage attributed to gauge resentment continues for years. <laughs> oh, Anti-train action. The local Presbyterian church actually split into two congregations based on pro-Erie gauge and pro-Ohio gauge <laughs> factions. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, find anyone who loves anything as much as Presbyterian congregations love splitting. <laughs> That's good and point. it 
a local pro Ohio gauge newspaper in Erie had its offices burned to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I will point out, like Scotland has the the OG Presbyterians, and of them, uh, there was a split with them, which created the Free Church of Scotland, and then there was a split from that, which created an even smaller Free Church of Scotland, the, the real Free Church, Church of Scotland. The Freer Church. Oh my yeah, god. <laughs> called, called the We Frees, and um. Uh, Charles Kennedy, uh, the uh, the Lib Dem politician, used to be a member, and he was banned from his church for something like for for life. Uh, his church of like twenty years, because he had been to the funeral of a friend of his who was a Protestant. Uh, I mean, like the wrong kind of Protestant. And oh so, my God. like, yeah, the absolute psycho shit. Yes, that's but, fucking insane. Here's the thing. The Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula, the Franklin Canal Company, the Erie and Northeast, and the Buffalo and State Line Railroads were finally all the same gauge and now form something that kind of looked like a unified system if you know, kind of squinted at it, right? And the bright side is that while the State Line, you could actually get off at the liquor store. And then hmm. you could leave $300 poor with a bunch of weird gins no one's ever heard of. Yeah, exactly. and you don't have to like hustle onto a different train. No, and you can stop at the nice Wawa across the street. Yeah, if anything, it's 40... actually increased so could... the amount of commerce. Exactly, yeah, and then you and... can run 20 minutes late to your friend's wedding because you just had to stop for a cup of coffee, even though you knew we were late and you got in the shower 20 minutes late <laughs> because you like annoying your friend for no good fucking reason. Roz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this, uh, this system of railroads was now nominally aligned with the New York Central Railroad as opposed to the Erie Railroad, right? And as such, trains could now travel from New York City to Cleveland and soon on to Chicago and points west with only one break of gauge, and that was at Buffalo. And they managed to sort of get rid of that through a wonderful thing called the Compromise Car. Um, ah, radical centrism. Yes. <laughs> All right, so some gauges were close enough together. The railroads ran compromised cars. What you did was, you know, your normal railroad wheel, if we look at it in profile, you know, you got the flange and you got, you know, you got the tread that sits on the rail, right? Uh, here, here's a rail. Um, right, okay. So that's a normal railroad wheel. What do you do in the compromised car is because the gauges are close together. You might have a four foot ten inch gauge and four foot eight and a half inch gauge. You want a car that runs on both. What you do is you just extend this out. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so now I can fit on other. So like an R. So like an RV. <clears throat> with the slide. Yeah. Outs. Okay. Exactly. Right. So you just have a deeper tread on the wheels, and what this did. Was it let the cars run on both gauges, and also the ride was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it works on both equally poorly. Exactly. Compromise. It's what, it's what, this, it's what democracy is about. Right? That's right. The lib car. I personally, I personally believe every mile of track should have a different but similar gauge everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> to encourage, like, new ideas. Exactly. So, I believe the train from Moscow to Helsinki actually still uses a system like this. Huh. Uh, Russian Helsinki, gauge, or, and, yeah, Russian and then standard gauge, gauge yeah. at the border, huh? Right. No, nah, Finnish gauge is uh, what? 4 foot 11. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, probably then what happened is the Russians imposed that on them as yeah. a way of like extending a Russian... Punish Punishing yeah. them for the winter war by making them yeah. take a dumb <laughs> That's <cage. right. laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, all right, so this is an early passenger car. This is an early Pullman sleeping car. This is what you call sort of a cracker box car, right? Before they got like the nice fancy clear story on top, this is just a very simple thing, right? They, 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 it's, it's, it's basically a box car frame that's been extended. You know, um, I always thought because it was architecture, yeah. it was pronounced clerestory. No, it's a clear story. Clerestory, like a like a like a fucking bit of a church, you know. I need to worry no, about my it's like uh, a... my cholesterol. My doctor. Tells me <laughs> <about> my <cholesterol. laughs> 
No, it's a, it's a clear story because it's a bunch of windows, but there's no floor there. It's like a story of the building, but you know, it's clear. <laughs> Notably not spelled clear story. I know, right? It's Don't weird. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so... And these early cars, um, they're very bad in accidents, right? Cars would telescope into each other. They were heated with coal or kerosene stoves, right? And they would tip over and set fire to the wooden cars, right? There was such a thing as self-extinguishing stoves, but they didn't, they didn't work that good and they weren't commonly used anyway. Were they expensive uh, as well? Or just, just uh, Yes. Do you know? Okay. How is it supposed to self-extinguish? Yeah, that was actually my next question. I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe it tips over and there's something that like went upright, it's fine. Mm. Yeah, it's going it to be some over. kind of like bullshit device invented yeah, yes. by a guy in a frock coat. That's, uh, I believe, an uh, operating system, BSD, yes. <laughs> it's the best one. <laughs> BSD stands for best system design. <laughs> <laughs> I ever tell so, you the story of the guy I saw wearing the BSD t-shirt when I worked at the liquor store and I said, nice BSD shirt. And he was so happy that his wife came up to him and said, see, honey, someone else knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now that we know about that, we need to talk about the, the Cleveland, Painesville and Ashtabula railroads bridge. Yeah, talk about Painesville, Pain baby. Ashtabula <laughs> River. No, we're talking about Ashtabula. Oh, which, okay. I th which I, again, in my mispronunciation thing, thought was Ashtabula. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it I'm is... just going to do the thing that you do where you mispronounce all of the names. It's just I do them for America. Ah, I see, I see. I, I, so, I, love, to, I love to go to Ashtabula in Ohio. No, Alice, you're being culturally insensitive because oh, this no. is an Algonquin word. Ah, oh, shit. Um, yeah, exactly. Ashtabula is Algonquin for uh, always enough fish to go around. Aw. That's nice. Yeah. It's, uh, know, right? It reminds me of like the, the equivalent worst original name of a place, which is uh, Vorkuta which is where they built uh, one of the biggest gulags. And the reason I know that is because the name in Nenet means place teams with bears. Oh, God. Oh, I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> All right. So, the Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula is this line right here. This is now... I think CSX. Um, I, for a second, I thought you were going to say this is now condos. Oh, uh, no. No, this is, a, this is a current... Well, you can see there's a Walmart Supercenter over here. Um, so, the Ashtabula River crossing is right here. It has always crossed on a high bridge, right? Um, this was originally like a wooden truss with stone arch abutments, right? Um, now, this railroad was owned by a man named a massa stone, right? Oh my who also God. owned a contracting company which constructed all the rail the railroad and all its structures. Um, his brother-in-law was a man named William Howey, right? Who invented the Howey Truss. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Do we collapse them and how? Yes. <laughs> and uh, a massa stone had worked at his firm for a while. He built some large bridges in New England. A lot of them crossed the Connecticut River. Um, now in the first three quarters of the 19th century bridge engineering was still fairly primitive, right? You don't, you don't use a lot of math. You have a lot of rules of thumb, right? It's more of an art than a science. <laughs> exactly, it's right. It's being made by a guy with like a really obscure but technically biblical name. Jabez mm -hmm. oh, is going to build you a bridge. Mustache. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Je Jedediah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, Jedediah mm -hmm. is going to build you a fucking bridge. <laughs> So the CPNA built this wooden truss in 1852, um, but Amasa uh, decides we're gonna we need to replace this bridge in 1863, right? And he has a radical idea, which is, what if we make a Howie truss but all in iron? Yeah, hmm. make it more stronger. Good. Yeah, exactly. Right. So let's look at a Howie truss. This is an example right here on this slide. Um, so, Howie trusses were developed by William Howie in 1840. This is uh, designed specifically for a composite wood and iron 
uh, design. It's very simple. It's very light. It's very easy to construct. So you have a you have this top cord up here. This is in compression. You have a bottom cord that's in tension, right? So it sort of bows out this way, and this sort of bows out this way when under load because the chain runs through the middle of the truss, right? Um, these are both made of wood. Um, you have these diagonal braces. They're made of wood. They're always in compression. The way you keep it that way is these iron tie rods, right? And these are always in tension. They're kept that way because there's some nuts on the end. Uh, which you, yes. It also said wood butts into lugs. <laughs> wood, yes. wood butts into nuts. Yes. <laughs> Hold on, I have, I have a drop for this. Oh, God. Wait, do I have a drop for this? Do I put it under D? Yeah, I have a drop for this. Will your mouth still remember the taste of these nuts? <laughs> <Got it>! uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you have these iron uh, tension rods here, and what you do is once you build the bridge, you still have false work in place that's supporting it. You go get a big 1840s wrench and you tighten the thing up, right? And, and you basically go until you hear the wood creak, and then you loosen it up a little bit, and then you're good, right? Wait, what's yeah. false work? And false work is we'll like you have a sort of wooden trestle underneath the bridge as you're building it, uh, okay. which you then okay. you then remove at the end. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and then at all the junctions between intersections between all these members, there's uh, these things called angle blocks. They're made of cast iron. And, um, you know, you, you hold these wooden pieces together basically by friction alone, right? The wood, as Liam said, the wood butts into <laughs> lugs, right? <laughs> Which are cast on the side of the angle block. You we'll see butts. in a few <laughs> slides how this works. And it's there. There's a bolt there to hold it in, but you know it's kind of it's just there, right? I sh I should have put something here. Um, so what do you mean? The, it's just the there? bolt. The bolt in this case is that one member of the group project who shows up and gets an A. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> exactly. That's the uh, that that's the that's, that's doing a whole hell of a lot of work here. So there were such things as all iron Howie trusses, but they were pretty rare, right? Um, you usually use... just... Yeah, you'd use something less materially intensive for okay. uh, an iron okay. bridge, right? You know, a Pratt truss or a Warren truss, and these were not common until after, like, the 1880s. Mm. So you're just trying um, to flex if you build one of these all out of iron. No, you're not trying to flex because uh, cast <laughs> iron is very brittle. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a mass of stones, Howie Truss was going to be among the largest ever built, right? This is a 154 foot clear span, 76 feet above uh, the, uh, the uh, surface of the Ashtabula River. It's going to be a record. We went over this with the Quebec City Bridge. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them that. <laughs> You've angered God again. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing he did, which was unconventional, as well as building this all out of iron, is rather than having the deck on the bottom cord, he was going to put the deck on the top cord of the truss, right? Uh, and so he, why is that he proposed, um, because it, it kind of, it, it, it just loads the bridge in a different way. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The enough, bad right. way. Yeah. Oh. Well, you would still have some similar loading, but we'll we'll sort of see how this affects how the bridge performs later on in the uh, in the program. Um, so, rather than use wooden beams on the bridge, Amasa Stone said he would just use iron cast iron I beams. Right, cast iron is very good in compression, not so good in tension. Um, during this time, you'd also have wrought iron as a separate thing, which is very good in tension, not so good in compression. So your verticals would be wrought iron, your diagonals would be cast iron, right? Um, otherwise, this is very similar construction to a wooden bridge. We don't have like things like welding at this point. Um, it's an iron bridge held together with carpentry techniques. <laughs> oh, good. That sounds safe. Yes. 
And one of the nice things, of course, is the iron was going to be provided by the Cleveland Rolling Mill, which was oh, owned I by a mass of stones his brother. brother. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that, that good, that good, good we, 19th century yeah, corruption. We, we know a guy who's going to get it to us I, for like half price. Friends and family. Yeah, this, is my, this is my iron guy. <laughs> I told All you right. not to call me that for the mom. <laughs> <laughs> also, the dude's brother was called Andros, which again, yeah, yeah, with yeah, the yeah. names in this family. Oh uh, yeah, it's uh wasn't he the boss in Star Fox? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because now we need to introduce another guy. Uh who's the good guy? Joseph Tomlinson the third. Okay. Him. Yeah. So he's he's an English immigrant. Uh, uh, he was a. Yeah. Uh, I know. Okay. So maybe not that good. Um, <laughs> he's a prolific bridge and lighthouse builder. He's built. He built like literally hundreds of bridges in um, both Canada and the United States in this era. Um, he, worked, he sounds like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he worked Get his mostly. Ass, Liam. <laughs> he worked mostly in New England and New Brunswick, uh, New Brunswick, Canada, right? Constructed, again, hundreds of bridges, and he was plagued with bad clients. Um, yeah, uh, listen, so, if one client says you're an asshole, they're an asshole. If all your clients <laughs> say you're an asshole, you're the asshole. <laughs> yeah, but that's the so, beautiful thing about engineering, is you can be the asshole so long as you're right. Yeah, yes. exactly. Uh, he was he was generally right. <laughs> generally like, no, this wouldn't work. So, for instance, this is the first Grand Falls Bridge in Grand Falls, New Brunswick, which he designed, right? I personally uh, Tom- would call it the first Grand Stays Up Bridge, but go off. Ah, uh, there's where you're wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Tomlinson recommended to the, uh, the Grand Falls City Council, he's like, you need a suspension bridge for this. That's the only way we can do this span, which I'm not sure what the span is. It's it's something that I'm sure you could do with a single like girder now, but back then you needed a suspension bridge. But the Grand Falls City Council was like, no, what you need to do is build a lenticular truss, right? Oh, no, to be no. fair, any excuse to say the word lenticular, which is very mm-hmm. fun, having the properties of a mm-hmm. lens, Yes, exactly, which is what this thing is here. That's, that's you know, it, it does look like a lens, right? I think, I think Brunel built a big uh, lenticular truss that's very famous. I forget which one it is, though. Um, so he's like, all right, yeah, I'll build a bridge. This might work. It's probably fine, right? <laughs> so he built the bridge, and it almost immediately collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, okay, haven't, haven't proved that this bridge would not work. He, he, he went back and said, you see, I told you you needed the suspension bridge. And they built a suspension bridge in 1860, and that lasted 55 years, right? Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so... I, <laughs> the I told you so bridge. Yeah, I yeah, told you so. That's actually what it's called. <laughs> it's just got a big 50-foot tall portrait of himself at either entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Giving the finger, Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Actually drive over one of his middle fingers. <laughs> <laughs> really beautiful uh, stone work, uh, iron work, actually. Oh yeah. So after this, uh, after he he moved he moved out of New Brunswick, he moved to Cleveland. He found employment with the uh, Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula Railroad. Oh, um, I sense tension. <laughs> yeah. Get it? Do you get yes. it? Yes. Because tension. T- tension, tension, compression, uh, buckling, various other things. So. <laughs> a mass of stone had this idea for this iron howie truss, and what he did is he started he started out with a vague design for the whole thing, right? And then a mass of stone hired on Tomlinson, and he handed him the plans for the Ashtabula Bridge and said, "Okay, and you flesh this out, finish this. I got to go attend to my enormous railroad empire, right?" He he doesn't have time to design the bridge himself because again he's overseeing this incredible huge railroad empire that stretches from Cleveland to just outside of Cleveland. Right? <laughs> you missed it, but I accidentally opened iTunes on my girlfriend's laptop and Dancing Queen by 18s came on at full blast. 
And it was oh awesome. God. Using 15 seconds I just had in my entire life. <laughs> good now. I'm good now. All right. So Tomlinson got to work and he immediately saw a whole bunch of problems with this bridge, right? The design. You yeah. know, for, first principles problems, right? So all right, what's wrong? This is a this is sort of a a a, a a, a, an elevation view of the part of the bridge, which is the problem, right? What's wrong with this? And you might say, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I might say, if I'm a mass of stone, nothing. Fuck you. Uh, yes. It's perfect. I drew this. Eat shit. It's, it's a great bridge. Uh, yes. I see uh, the problem might be something called the dead load down here. The biggest load a bridge has to support is the bridge itself. The quote dead load. Uh, and then there's a rant Great. about Great. Then there's a rant about Paul. E extra here. extra credit for reading reading the notes, Liam. <laughs> Those notes? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so okay, I look, might, I look at them. This is a perfectly fine wooden Howie truss, right? And you might say, okay, smart guy, I've played Polly Bridge. Right? That's right. <laughs> and I know. That if I build a bridge with a stronger material, it will be stronger. That's right. right. I'm always yes. saying yes. this. I have finished <laughs> literally half dozens of poly bridge levels. And so I am pretty certain <laughs> that if you just make everything out of girders, it's going to be fine. Yes. But actually, Gir girder no. is gooder. Oh. Oh. My feelings. Yeah, so uh, what, one of the things they do in games like Polybridge, they really exaggerate something called the live load, which is, you know, the weight of a vehicle crossing the bridge or something like that. But what bridges really have to contend with is the dead load. Yeah, also real bridges don't tend to have to, like, make cars do backflips and get onto a hill yeah. higher on the other side. Yes, this is also true. So, you know, the biggest load the bridge has to support is the dead load, which is the weight of the bridge itself, you know, the girders, the deck, so on and so forth. Then you have a live load on top, which especially in modern, especially really big bridges is almost trivial. Um, so, yeah, games like Polybridge exaggerate the live load for more interesting gameplay, you know, and you have like, I don't know, like, yeah, uh, what, uh, a, a limousine on a flatbed trailer that has like two other cars on top or whatever going across the bridge. Um, but, you know, that's for interesting gameplay. In real life, it's boring, right? So your iron bridge here is, to start out with, much heavier than the wooden bridge. Therefore, it has to be much stronger to start out with just to hold itself up. Well, luckily, right? it is much stronger because it's made out of iron. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So we don't have much in the way of math to do calculations on this at the time. Uh, but Tomlinson took a look and he suspected something was wrong and a mass of stones was uh, design was too lightly constructed. So he came back with a more heavily built structure. He had extra iron reinforcing along the diagonals, right? And he had several other changes and Stone looked at it and he's like, no, you've, you've, you've compromised my vision. I will not make these changes, right? <laughs> we love clients, don't we, folks? Yeah, exactly. So... Tomlinson was like, well, I'm not going to build the bridge unless you make it safer. Um, and so a massive stone fired him, right? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> King. King shit. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the CP&A Railroad's uh, chief engineer, Charles Collins, also took a look at the bridge. And he's like, you know, I think Tomlinson's changes are a good idea, right? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, a massive stone had him removed from the bridge construction uh, project. <laughs> King! <laughs> I love this guy. Anybody who says that I cannot oh, build up. my death bridge is fired. Love it. Then a massive stone took time out of his busy schedule of monitoring trains, uh, of, running a, of running a 50 mile railroad uh, to design the damn thing himself. And he removed Tomlinson's extra iron, right? Which leads us to. The construction of the bridge, right? So he hired a contractor, A.L. Rogers, who was a carpenter, right, oh, in 1865. 
Um, not so uncommon at the time. There weren't too many iron bridges. So you, you, that's basically all you have to go on is carpenters, right? Um, now, Tomlinson's original designs said that the bridge needed seven inches of camber, right? That means when the bridge was being built with the false work underneath, I'm drawing lines here to sort of show, you know, the false work that would have been under the bridge when it was being built. This fault false work would be designed. So as it was being built, the center of the bridge would be seven inches above the horizontal, right? And then the idea was once the false work was removed, the bridge would settle into the abutments, did oh, drop a few that. inches, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that was my, that was because I kind of just pictured, uh, you know, a mini Tacoma Narrows or one where like a deck is seven inches higher than another. And I just didn't understand that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, this is, this is, uh, yeah. So they, they design it kind of hog backed and then it would, you know, settle into place. Yeah, right, right. Right. Okay. So, and this, this would improve like the, uh, the, 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 this would mean the diagonals were under more compression than they would be otherwise and make the bridge stronger. Right. Sure. Um, so the, the, the contractor, A.L. Rogers, he started construction of false work under the assumption that the seven-inch camber would be kept. Oh, and wow. a mass of stone said, no, that's dumb. Wow. Uh, <laughs> he said, that, that's way too much camber. My bridge is too strong for that. I want three and a half inches of camber. Right? Awesome. And, uh, point, and like he, the guy, the two previous guys oh, who said oh. no to him have just been instantly fired. They got, yeah, they got 86. <laughs> yeah. So, now the thing is, at this point, the I-beams had already been ordered and delivered. Right? <laughs> okay. His, his brother has delivered the I-beams. So what they do is they, get, they, they just shave down each end of the I-beam to compensate for the camber. Right? Oh, awesome. So the wonderful thing back in this day is you could get huge structures like this built very, very quickly because uh, I, I have no idea why. Probably no paperwork. <laughs> no, and yeah, um, no, no yeah, oversight. No don't care how many people die doing it. Yeah. Uh, if you try to unionize, the Pinkertons kill all of you. You don't even have a concept of unions yet. You know, that won't be around until like 1877. Mm. You know, when uh, that was when uh, Philadelphia declared war on Pittsburgh because they had too much labor militancy. Um, we fucked that one up. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, the bridge was rapidly completed, right? And the false work was removed, and the bridge, which had been built at three and a half inches of camber, um, immediately sank five inches. Ooh. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So I was two and a half inches below the horizontal, and even a massive stone looked at it and was like, hmm. That's not oh, good. I shouldn't have fired those guys. They yeah. told me about this exact thing. <laughs> we, we gotta, we gotta jack the bridge up. Whoopsie yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, 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 yeah. Put a lift, put a lift kit on the bridge. One of those obnoxious <laughs> ass. Oh my god! Bars. You're just playing so, my summer car. You just stack beer crates up <laughs> under this bridge. Well, what they did is they put the false work back in and they jacked up the bridge. Oh my god. Okay. Jesus Christ, man. And they realized, okay, we have to actually, these I-beams are now too short. But you can't really just make them longer, right? Yeah, you've already, oh. me measure twice, cut once, but you've already cut, right. so. Yeah, exactly. So what they do is they decide to use on a lift kit. shims. Oh, oh boy. no. Oh, oh boy. God. Oh, boy. Oh, no, God. This is what holds my basement TV up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if they if they increase the length of the I beams, they'd need to require reordering iron for the whole bridge. So you know they put some shims in there, and you know this is 1863. Reordering iron for the bridge might have taken four or five weeks. Um, so we're that. literally <laughs> we're talking about wooden wedges here. Mm -hmm. yep. that no, you just uh, there's a little iron wedges. Oh, uh, okay. Oh. Well, that's not yeah, as bad. Yeah, I was expecting it to just yeah. be like, yeah, we just hammer them in there, and it's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so they go in, they put the shims in, right? The false work came back out, 
and several of the diagonals, uh, the diagonal I beam sections buckled, right? Ew. And I realized, okay, this is also bad. The false work was put back in. <laughs> <laughs> a mass of stone decided okay maybe we do have to add more iron to the bridge so he added iron to the diagonals right but he also had the I-beams rotated 90 degrees along their axis since he thought they could carry more load that way so what this did right so your, the I-beam was shaped you know like this like an I right Mm-hmm. Each end, it butts into the lug on the angle block, which is sort of shaped like this, right? Except a little bit, you know, tighter than that, right? So Stone said, we need to rotate this 90 degrees, right? Oh, but they boy. don't want to recast the ir- angle blocks. That would essentially be rebuilding the whole bridge. So what they did instead was at the end of, if you imagine this is the I-beam, right? At the end of the I beam, they just cut notches into the web. <laughs> Come on. So, yeah. Now each each diagonal was made of variable number of I beams, right? So oh, in the okay. center it'd be like five. At the ends it'd be like two, right? Because you need the most strength in the center, right? Um so in addition to doing this, they also uh, loosened up the vertical pre-stressed members so that the I-beams were under less compression because obviously if they're buckling, you probably tighten it up a little bit too much. I don't think they had torque wrenches back then. So they, it, and if they did, they wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, hold on, I'll be right back. How you doing, Liam? I'm good, Alice. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, I just um, um, I got done recording two episodes of Trash Future today, so I've had you're kind doing of a, a triple header. Yeah, a triple header. I've had kind of a long a long work day. I'm just thankful I don't have a a, a stream this evening. Uh, that would be brutal. Well, I'm glad. Uh, hopefully, we can we can finish this one out in a way that's. Uh, oh yeah, this is definitely the know, high note. But goes. Oh yeah, that's right, Riley. That's right, Riley. <laughs> Suck it up. I well, was like the, about to open a cider in your honor. I just had to get up. Oh, please. Head. Yeah. Uh, see, in the United States, uh, at least in Pennsylvania, Alice, our gas stations do not sell beer as a rule. Really? Yeah. So, like, in other states, they do. And Sheets, the greatest, grocery, the greatest gas station known to mankind, mm-hmm. most of those have beer. But there's only one Wawa that sells beer, which is yet another entry in the Sheets is Better Than Wawa debate. <laughs> so I'm drinking a uh, a Down East unfiltered double oh. blend. Oh, very nice. Yeah. No, we, we were doing, um, I, I did um, a trash feature about a terrible Netflix movie and a Britonology bonus episode which one? with which which, um, movie? Spencer Confidential. Oh, that sounds horrible. I it watched... Was- yeah, it was like a I solid watched, four uh, out of ten movie. I watched Holiday, which I had been told would be charmingly bad, mm. but which it was just dreadful. It An eternal amazing. Netflix mood. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Emma Rob uh, not Emma. Yeah, Emma Roberts is is I'm sure very lovely and talented, but she sure as hell wasn't in this movie. <laughs> well. <laughs> hey buddy. How's it going? Sorry about that. I had to A use the restroom, B check on the chili. <laughs> no oh, worries. What'd you, put, what'd you put in the chili? What I put in the chili? Oh, yeah. it's um shitload of onion, shitload of garlic, mm-hmm. um, jalapeno, chipotle's in adobo. Um, it is half ground beef, half ground pork, um, tomatoes, uh, threw a yingling in there as well. Ah, oh, that sounds uh, good as hell. Oh, I haven't yeah, been able to like, put a stout in there. Uh, I haven't been able to really eat shit lately because like one of my teeth just oh, fucking right, collapsed, right. uh, oh, and because like the, there's no dentist because of the COVID, so I'm just like I'm muscling through with ibuprofen right now, and I'm suffering. Oh, so poor thing. Yeah, yeah you gotta no, I, you, I, you gotta subscribe to the Patreon so I can get some some dental care. 
I was about to say, yeah, I was like, wow, I, you know, you, you should probably see a dentist. And I remembered you were in the UK and I was like, oh, you may have <laughs> the, to cross the border yeah, for the, that. The, the big book of British smiles is absolutely what's going on with me right now. That's, that's, oh, that's going to be an issue when they do Brexit, you know, because oh, you're not going to be able to go it, to yeah. where the dentists are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to time it. So it's in between the end of lockdown, which we're on here now again. So I can't like do anything for it. I thought and, Boris was going to fix it. Yeah, we got a time. I got to time it so precisely in between the end of lockdown and the start of Brexit, I get somebody to yank this fucking thing out of my mouth and stop causing me absolute agony. Oh, it's going to be a great year for Britain. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I would define it too. Hmm. Yes. Anyway, so what are we all here for again? Who are oh, you wait, people? How did you get Drugs and, our... Drugs and whores! <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I was going to mention is that because they loosened up the uh, vertical members, um, they actually had to throw even more shims on the diagonals. <laughs> oh, <for fuck's> sake, <laughs> this is a conspiracy by Big Shim. Yeah. Big Shim. <laughs> Big Shim. <laughs> I think the point, the point of a shim is to be small. <laughs> Not now. You know, Big Shim <laughs> killed JFK, right? Shim, I, you know, Alice, I've heard that too. Yeah, he was going to close down the CIA Shim office. All right, so, all right, so they built the bridge. This is a picture of the bridge, um, or an illustration of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you can this see is these a photograph of the yeah. bridge. Yeah, you can see uh, these arched abutments at each end, right? You can see these old piers on the ends those are from the old bridge um and they built this new bridge and they tested it right it's the old timey testing the way you tested a bridge back in the day right is you would find all the locomotives you could and he would run them all over the bridge at a low rate of speed and the designer of the bridge had to stand in the middle of it <laughs> which sounds good <laughs> in the 19th century but as we now realize, this is makes basically no difference to the load on the bridge. Yeah. So now this is um, okay. So the bridge, the bridge performed satisfactorily, and in fact performed fine for eleven years after it was built. Well, time to end but, this episode. Thanks for yeah, yeah. coming to. Well, there's yeah. your problem, everybody. Yeah, exactly. Where nothing happened. No, nothing bad happened. Um, but actually, now. One thing none of the research, none of the sources I looked at mentioned, but I think it was worth mentioning, is sort of the context of railroading between about 1860 and 1880, right? It got significantly uh, more based. Yes. Yeah. And things um, got heavy. Things got real heavy real quick, right? So this is, so this locomotive on the left. The General. The general, yes, uh, fa oh. famously involved in a locomotive chase in the Civil War. This was built in 1855 for the Western and Atlantic Railroad, which was I have no, I, I honestly can't even tell you where Western and Atlantic is. Um, <laughs> the, the lost city, again, the lost continent of Atlantis, was linked yes. to uh, fucking San Francisco. I think it was somewhere like in. Um, it, it, it was somewhere like almost south, but not quite. Mm. Um, this is a 440. It's got four guiding wheels. It's got four driving wheels, no trailing wheels, right? Um, this was about 23 tons, right? It's Atlanta now, to Chattanooga, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, uh, one of those is Atlantic, and the other one is yeah, that's a hype. Western, I guess. I guess so. Chattanooga, yeah. I guess. Nominally Western. still in existence. It's just leased by CSX. Wow, oh, that sounds about right. I, I think a lot of these charters still exist. You know the new um, the new uh, Texas high speed rail thing that uh, uh JR oh, yeah, Japan yeah. Railways is trying to uh, um, uh, construct now. I think they're using a railroad charter from like the eighteen eighties. <laughs> 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 I just want to like, hear a lot of Texan dudes pronounce Shinkansen. Oh God, uh, yeah, Shinkansen. A Shinkansen. Shinkansen. Yeah. Rhymes I took, with Wisconsin. I, I took the Shinkansen. I was always confused because it doesn't go to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> so, Unless you're going to Arkansas, then it's the Shinkansen. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open the shit pants off. Open the pants off. <laughs> Low effort jokes, baby. That's Liam. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's very right. good. So this one's 23 tons. Now, uh, 18 years later, 1873, right? So this is another 440. You might think this looks very similar, right? Because of improvements in construction and just larger boilers and all this other stuff, this locomotive is much, much more powerful, right? Um, this is the Dayton, built for the Virginia and Truckee uh, Railroad. Um, and this is 78 tons. Oh, boy. Which is much more than 23 tons. Yeah, I have heard that. Yes. Just now from you, that 78 yeah. is a much, much larger number than 23. Yes, so it's three times as much, and then some. Another thing is, through this era, uh, trains got a lot faster. You know, you had passenger trains that were holding a steady 40 or 50 or even 60 miles an hour, right? Yeah, and it needs um, that power right. to pull heavier wagons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the passenger cars and freight cars also got bigger and heavier. Uh, yeah, they're no longer made out of paper mache. Oh, <laughs> yes. No. Well, no, they're still made of wood at this point. Um, oh, wow. Stronger yeah. wood, but still wood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're just um, more of them, and they're bigger. <laughs> more, more wood. Yeah. Uh, em embarrassingly, a lot of railroads hit their sort of final scheduled speed around this era. Like trains don't go much faster now than they did then. So <laughs> Bring it back. Yeah, it was, yeah, some of them are even faster. Some some of them were running faster schedules than what Amtrak can do right now. I think not this particular train. I, I believe the sched the Amtrak schedule between uh, Buffalo and Cleveland is about one hour faster now than it was in 1873. <sighs> of such uh, things, of progress made. I know, right? <laughs> so as these. As these more powerful, heavier locomotives became available, you know, bridges, infrastructure were strengthened sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. sometimes and then see, other times. A lot of weight here. Oh, boy. So, other times. So, December 29th, 1876, right? So, the CPNA had been merged into the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern, right? A massive stones railroad empire now stretched all the way from Chicago to Buffalo. Although he had to retire from the uh, uh, general management in 1875 because of ill health. He was still on the board, right? At this point, there was a scheduled service called the Pacific Express, right? And this ran from New York and Boston to Chicago and St. Louis, right? They Noticeably sort of not on the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, but at this point, there was a transcontinental railroad you could transfer to, so there was at least that. Um, so you know this this um you know so they had like two sections of train. They combine at Albany. They'd split again, and I have no idea where. Um, so they would. This train left Erie, Pennsylvania at five o one p.m. Right. Uh, December 29th, 1876, heading to Chicago, right? This is an 11-car train, including a bunch of compromised cars. Um, so, you know, everyone's having a pretty rough ride, right? But it's to be expected, right? Um, and it, there's a blizzard happening, right? So there's 20 inches of snow on the ground. There's 54-mile-an-hour gusts. There's six-foot-deep snow drifts, right? Uh, with the one locomotive, which was called the Socrates. Fuck him uh, up, Socrates. Socrates. Yeah. Was unable to keep mm -hmm. the train moving, so they added a second locomotive, the yeah, Columbia. Yeah, Daryl, Socrates' friend. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and so they added that, train, that, that locomotive to the train after Buffalo to provide extra uh, power. It was 16 degrees Fahrenheit. That's ne negative 9 degrees Celsius outside. Fuck that. Fuck getting a like barely heated wooden train through that. Oh no, you got a big kerosene stove, you're fine. You know, the, 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 the way you solved this problem back then was just add more heat. Ah. Yeah. 
It's all right. It's uh, you know, sort of late in the day. It's dark, you know, but you know, everyone's still awake. They got candles going in a car, keeping it lit up. You know, people are, you know, playing cards in the club car, so on and so forth, right? So um, smoking massive cigars. Oh yeah, just gigantic fucking cigars, like bigger than you've ever seen. Because <laughs> this was a um there were some day coaches on this train, but most of the sleeper cars were, uh, you know, a little, little, little more prestigious, uh, you know, extra fare cars, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, they're approaching Ashtabula Station about 7.30 p.m. They're an hour and 53 minutes behind schedule, and they have to cross the Ashtabula River to sort of glide into the station, right? So, uh, you know, the engineer shuts off the throttle. He indicates the crew on the second locomotive shut off the throttle, right? They're sort of coasting in. About 15, 16 miles an hour. And the engineer of the first locomotive, Daniel McGuire, feels the bridge sag underneath him. No, suddenly thank feels, you. Suddenly feels like he's that. driving the train up as opposed to on the level. And he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a <laughs> faster reactions than I would have had. Mm-hmm. So I, sim- I simply slammed. fling myself out of the locomotive off the edge of the bridge. I don't think that would have helped you. No, I no. I, I die the faster way. <laughs> no, he 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 lived because <laughs> oh, he slammed the throttle all the way open, just wide open. Just all right, we're going, we're going, we're getting off this bridge before something happens, right? Hell yes, um, yeah, exactly. So. This immediately snaps the Lincoln pin coupler between the first locomotive and the second locomotive. Oh, right? not so much. Yeah, no, not so good. You. So at this point, like the 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 bridge collapses enough so that the tender of the Socrates is half hanging off the abutment, but because the train the locomotive has enough power, it just sort of drags it onto the bridge. Nice. Imagine right. the noise off of that. I know, right? But then <sighs> the bridge very slowly continues to collapse and brings the second locomotive down with it, as well as the cars on top of the bridge. And then the several cars behind it are drawn by the couplers over the edge and into the abyss. Oh, boy. Oh. Yeah. That's not so good. That's so good, no. So, you know, it plunges it and plunges these cars into the frozen over Ashtabula River. Lots of people are instantly killed on impact. Um, lots of these wooden cars, they fell on top of other wooden cars and sort of collapsed them into a pancake. Some of the cars, you know, telescoped into each other. Lots of people very gravely injured almost immediately. You know, maybe not killed outright, but they're very gravely injured. Well, the good news is that the finest of emergency medical services of the 1870s are going to be right on this, I'm sure. Yes, of course. The other thing is, when you're in a train wreck in the 1800s, the crash is only part one. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You have senses now. Bar. Bar. Yes. (laughs) You had all those kerosene stoves, and all of a sudden, everything's on fire, like, immediately. (laughs) What's the big deal? You're on top of a river. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's cold you yeah, it's fire's cold. hot you, you, it's gonna you, go you, out you, yeah exactly I, I've i played Pokemon I know how this works <laughs> <laughs> alright so it's sort of raging inferno begins almost immediately right starts by the overturned stoves and the candles um, in fact I believe a lot of the passenger cars did not initially catch fire but one of them did and that was enough to do it Right, the train was fully consumed in flames in under twenty minutes. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, Daniel McGuire driving Socrates, right? He 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 keeps the throttle open. He screams into the next into the Ashtabula station. He starts just blowing the whistle the whole time. He's ringing the bell and he yells out, "Hey, the br- the bridge collapsed! Bridge we collapsed!" And then you know I have to get the old timey sort of alar- alarm going Did you say throughout the, the town. He collapsed like he was a pilot. <laughs> Yar. No, no. Yar. 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 He was from the, he was the, from the West Country colli- originally. <laughs> the bridge be collapsed. <laughs> the bridge be becalmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So yeah, they, gone, and then that get trouble for laughing at death. Yeah, they get the uh, they get the, he has like a he has like a, a parrot on his shoulder. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, he's like hundreds dead. What? Hundreds dead. What? Hundreds dead. <laughs> he's like coughing from all the coal dust from the locomotive. Yeah, uh, he's got he's gonna drop dead a black log at thirty, but it's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was about to say. I mean, I, I don't know. It's like if if you brought a parrot into a coal mine, would it last longer than a canary? Ooh, that's uh, a good question. Yeah, exactly. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I think a canary can fly faster than a parrot. It's my hypothesis. We're learning maybe, so maybe, much tonight. Yeah. I'm not a I'm not an ornithologist. Um, if you are so an not, ornithologist, and yeah. one thing I've learned is that the 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 YouTube comments contain all human knowledge, <clears throat> then mm-hmm. write in. Yes. yes. Um. Yeah. It's uh, uh uh as well as um you know people insulting us because we're scared of pigs. Well, that is within oh, the sum of all that. human knowledge. This is true. true. Yes. So. All right, so he drives the locomotive to the station. He's ringing the bell. He's uh, blowing the whistle. And he yells out to one of the people, the bridge has collapsed, right? And, you know, they get the old-timey alarm out, which means you go to every church and say, start ringing the bells. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so all the townspeople congregate, and, you know, they're like, oh, crap, this fucking bullshit happened. We got to <laughs> deal with this now, right? <laughs> Always, just, like the, just like the guy said it would. <laughs> It's it's seven thirty p.m. It's sixteen degrees out. It's dark because it's oh. December, right? And they they rush to the side of the wreck. The only way you could get down to the river was one single flight of narrow snow covered stairs. Awesome, right? So people go down there. They start trying to pull people from the wreck. Um, they start trying to get people up the side of the ravine where the Ashtabula River is. The Ashtabula Fire Brigade arrives, right? We're saved. Ashtabula's yeah, bravest. Well, it turns out the fire chief, G.W. Knapp, was uh, an alcoholic. Well, well I mean, right? you know, I don't hold that against him. Yeah, He's, with them all. It's the yeah, 1870s. Yeah. What is there to do? But he was at that time drunk. And of course, 1870s okay. alcoholic is on a whole nother level <laughs> from <laughs> what yeah, today he we would know, consider alcoholic. He doesn't know where he fucking where he is. is. No, he yeah. This is a mass yeah. text. Does anybody know where I am? <laughs> <laughs> the fire brigade shows up. They bring their big steam powered horse drawn pump. And Nap concludes, there's no use in fighting the fire. Just let it burn out. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is like the, dr- the town drunk in a Western level of drunk right yes. now. Yeah, I mean, I doubt he could stand. He was relying on riding a horse to yeah. have some Good semblance of... Being uh, carried from the fire engine. Like, the horse is making useless. most decisions. Yeah. <laughs> the, the horse is the brains behind this operation. <laughs> the horse is just out here like this fucking guy again. I'm not your <laughs> wife. I'm not your wife. I know she has a face like a Clydesdale. It's 1876. I am not your wife. <laughs> Zenifer, or whatever the hell. Yeah. So, meanwhile, you know, there's still people audibly just screaming and moaning inside this burning wreck. Oh, that's right? not so good. Yeah, there's the folks yeah, climbing out of windows. Pretty yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> there's folks climbing out of windows. They're getting stuck in those windows. They're oh, burning no, to you. death in front of rescuers' eyes. Oh, you know, not, not, not dying of smoke inhalation. They're literally on fire. Um, oh. You got like a nasty, again, there's, it's a nasty sort of 1870s train derailment. So there's arms, there's legs, heads everywhere, nasty stuff. Oh yeah, right? just getting sheared off yeah. by like all those sharp yeah. edges and shit. Yeah, yeah it's a you slasher got, movie. Mm-hmm. You, you, yeah, but it's not, it, it's, it's, it's more, more of a really bad splinter, really. Oh. Like a mm. deadly splinter, you've been Thank impaled you, by wood. Thank as, you, Ross. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Oh, real, real like Hurtgen Forest mortar bombardment vibes, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, the tweet going around today where the guy's like, "I wish I could have grown up in the 1900s and <laughs> yeah. fought it, fought it for done." And I'm just like, I don't think you want to have fought it for done, there, bud. You probably would have died. 
Yeah, yeah statistically. You yeah, you would have been, sta- yeah. Statistically, you would have been killed. This is my three inches of mud I died over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, the townsfolk are kind of left to their own devices and they form a bucket brigade while this fire engine just sat there, right? Um, the firefighters themselves concentrated their efforts on pulling the wounded out of the wreck. Such um, a good, I imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They sort of set up a triage station in the engine house and on a ratty hotel next to the train station because there was no hospital in the town of Ashtabula. Oh, yeah. That's I've actually been through Ashtabula, Ohio recently, uh, about a year ago, and I can tell you it has not changed much. <laughs> so they had to, once they pulled survivors out of the wreck, they had to drag them up the, up the ravine. Oh my. And then, like a uh, half a mile to 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 the triage spot, right? They managed to pull all survivors from the burning wreck by twelve a.m. Right? Um, not long after, a bunch of thieves go in and they steal all the dead people's stuff. Classic. I yep. know, right? That's that good nineteenth-century crime, baby. Yeah, exactly. Well, ha- happened happened in the Blitz too. It was an air, air raid wardens were notorious. One woman woke up like unexpectedly regained consciousness to find a guy trying to pull the rings off of her fingers. Good lord. I should also point out while that guy was talking about wishing he was in the First World War that the Royal Army Medical Corps used to be uh backronymed to rob all my comrades because they were notorious <laughs> for just like a- anybody who was helpless enough to need their attentions would just have their pockets gone through. Good lord. <laughs> How you take the good with the bad. Yeah. yeah. All right, so around 1 a.m. a bunch of sergeants from Cleveland show up on an extra train, right? They dispatched a special train out because they had telegraphs back then, thank God. Um, so, like, the word got out relatively quickly that, oh my God, we had a hor- horrible disaster in Ashtabula. Send surgeons. So, yeah, they show up. Um, Just, like, somebody's going to need, like, to hack off a bunch of arms and legs and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go, we, get, we need a guy like, who owns his own ether. To do this, we need we, we need a tank car full of chloroform. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep pumping, keep pumping, yeah. keep pumping. So this is sort of the aftermath, right? You can see here. There's this sort of collection of railroad wheels and various iron ties that made up sort of the under under um, carriage of you know the railroad cars. Uh, not not a lot of wood to be seen. Mm. Um, on account of it all burned up. So, you know, you're just sort of trapped in this metal spaghetti if you somehow survived, which you didn't, of course. I, I don't think anyone was pulled out from under this still alive. Uh, you can see one of the locomotives over here. That's the Columbia, I would assume. Um, well, I don't think it could be any other locomotive. Um, so in the aftermath, right, there's estimates of how many people died uh, and the range is like from 83 people, that's the official number, to over 200 dead. There's, it was impossible to know because so many people were essentially just cremated by this fire, oh, yeah, right? Were, yeah. Fuck yeah. that. Yeah, and other yeah, people were, you know, just separated like, uh, in constituent parts. You know, there's just... Fucking uh, Piper Alpha. Yeah. We, fa- we found, we found uh, four arms and two legs and half a torso. I mean, this, is, this could have been some kind of like... Arachnid human. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, this is all... What, what the fuck? This carriage is all cryptids. Mm-hmm. Green Goblin, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, so there's no, there no real good records of how many people were on board the train, and the wreck investigators are still turning up remains in mid-January, right? Uh, eventually, eventually, the mayor has to station a guard at the wreck to stop people from looting the corpses, right? Uh, and a lot of a lot of the dead were never claimed. They were buried in a mass grave in Chestnut Grove Cemetery, right? So the investigation, um, they didn't have a coroner in the town of Ashtabula. <laughs> Just picturing so that- <laughs> a guy showing up in like a blue frock coat with like NTSB stenciled <laughs> on the back in yellow. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's but it's in like a really fancy 1800s. Yeah, font. yeah it's got like the Sarah <laughs> thing. God, we should make that a shirt. And he's like, uh, what, what's uh, what, what's like a real fancy like 1870s uh, turn? It would be like the National 
Bureau of <laughs> National Bureau of like Transportation and Irishman Monitoring. Yeah, exactly. Well, that'd be the function. It would have a much grander name. <laughs> <laughs> Society for the interest of the the Society for the Prevention of Railroad Irish. Catastrophes. I'm gonna oh. get onto onto our friend Matt Lubchansky about making a like nineteenth <laughs> century NTSB shirt. <laughs> so they th they had to convene a coroner's jury because there was no coroner, and so the Ashtabula so coroner's <laughs> yeah the Ashtabula coroner's jury found that you know this bridge was poorly designed, poorly constructed, poorly inspected. The railroad used the wrong type of stoves in the cars. The fire chief was neg negligent in his decision to let his horse figure out whether he should fight the fire or not, right? <laughs> what happened um, to that guy, is what I want to know. Did he at least get fired, or what? I don't I, think so. I mean, <laughs> I, I suppose in those days, if you had been, you could just walk to the next town over and be like, yeah, I'm the fire chief now. Can you believe this shit? <laughs> <laughs> the Ohio General Assembly also did an investigation. They settled on, yeah, this flawed design, flawed construction, with construction errors coupled with poor inspection. At this point, inspection was very, very informal uh, on every railroad except the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was, um, you know, run by nerds. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, and, and soon to be run by Confederates, um, oh, which well, is another story. All, Confederate nerds. Yeah, Confederate nerds. That was sort of post Civil War, though. Um, so then the, Charles MacDonald Commission, this was um, convened by the American Society of Civil Engineers, or its predecessor organization, really narrowed down the problem, right? Which was a single miscast lug in the top angle block near the West End. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how this works in the next slide. Um, I hate when someone miscasts my lugs. Yes. Some of my least so, favorite shit. Now, a mass of stone conducted his own invest. Liam, you're very, very quiet right now. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta fucking holla. Am I? Yeah. Am I really? God, yeah. dude. Uh, now you're better. Right, hold on. How's that? That's maximum. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's good. I mean, that's that's about as good as I can do. Yeah, I I'm having all sorts of technical issues today, for which I apologize. Listen, uh, it'll never fine. be as bad as the process. I'll set up. Wow. I'll set up. We love you, Dan. I'll send up. We did. I'll. I'll I'm going to report you to HR. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, we are HR. It's just you and me getting drunk and fighting. <laughs> I told you to have those expense reports on my desk at 4 p.m. today. I'll kill you. <laughs> All right, now, now you're too loud. Yeah. Also, th and that's, <laughs> that's how you I was deep became, throwing the mic. That's how you both became fire chiefs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, cool a hat, bad stone. hours. Yeah. A, a mass of stone and the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern Railroad conducted their own investigation of what happened. And they concluded, well, the train derailed and that caused the bridge to collapse. Or maybe a tornado hit it. One of these two things. But the bridge was fine. <laughs> Definitely fine. And extremely I, I, safe. I, I hate when there's like a tornado out of nowhere in Ohio. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Especially near the lake, that's where they are really known for yeah, having tornadoes. Yeah, a lake effect tornado, yeah. just the worst. Mm -hmm. In a blizzard, yeah. Mm. So, here's the fun one. Did anyone suffer any consequences? Well, apart from the people who got, like, variously mangled. Oh yeah, the people who are rendered into their constituent atoms more yeah. effectively yeah. than any modern dis uh, disaster can do. Uh, obviously, they <laughs> suffered consequences. It's incredible how these old railroad cars to just turn people into mush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Telescoping is not your friend. Yeah. So the railroad paid out about $500,000 to victims and families of victims uh, out, out of court, right? I mean, that, that you wouldn't. Thousand. Xboxes weren't even a thing yet, so you can't. Although, like, with inflation, is, that's not yeah. bad. You, you, yeah, you could buy yourself a nice horse and carriage, kid. You, you could get a. You could get a. You, you could a get a nice pocket watch. Nice pocket watch. 
nice pocket watch. You get you could get a um purse you get to one, lock of those, it. <laughs> st- one of those stereograms or whatever oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the stere- stereoscopic glasses, you know. Thousands you can look of ball at, and a cups. Yeah. <laughs> you get a whole bunch of hoops and sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there were no criminal charges filed, right? Uh, the railroad's chief bridge engineer, who was still Charles Collins, who again was prevented from constructing or being involved with the construction of this bridge, uh, he he put a bullet through his brain the day after the bridge collapsed. Jesus. Oh, geez. yeah, not so good. But he tried his best, and I mean, really like, did. yeah, yeah. It's got yeah. fired for it. Oh well, fired from the bridge stuff fired, anyway. Fired from fired from the project, not fired from the railroad. Mm. Uh, he, 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 some people say he always knew this thing was going to collapse at some point. Um, but I, I don't know if he was in a position where he could realistically do anything about it. Now, a mass of stone, of course, who I think has the most responsibility for this. This is this is um, just incredible. Um, he never accepted responsibility for the disaster. Um, but his reputation was ruined at this point, right? Good. Oh, no. But he, but he was still the richest man in Cleveland. So Yeah, but he, he still lived in Cleveland. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, richest man in Cleveland meant something different back then. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Now it's just Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah, I know. He's, he got himself involved in a whole bunch of weird financial schemes. I think he was uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the key financiers of the South Improvement Company, which was the first attempt to make Standard Oil a monopoly. Um, oh, cool! Yeah, that was uh, that was like a, that was a whole scam involving the Pennsylvania Railroad, the New York Central Railroad, and Rockefeller and Carnegie and a whole bunch of other people, um, which you know fell apart immediately. Uh, oh, the Avengers. <laughs> the League of Extraordinarily Wealthy Gentlemen. <laughs> um, so, you know, his, it, Massa Stone's reputation was ruined, so he, he had to turn in desperation to a life of philanthropy. <laughs> what he wound up doing was um, donating a shitload of money to Western Reserve College to move it to Cleveland. Um, and that, of course, became Case Western Reserve University. Um, the Western Reserve, of course, is the Connecticut Western Reserve. Um, yes. Yeah. And, you know, he, after this, he sort of, he, he suffered from depression. He went to Europe to try and, you know, care himself of it, and he came back. And then he had insomnia. He had really poor health. Then he put a bullet through his brain in 1830, 1883. Um, difficult to feel that bad about that guy, though. Yeah, I know, right? Also, pre pre twentieth century deaths don't count. Everyone was sad and drunk. Sad, drunk. Um, had various diseases. Mm. Uh, getting like getting absolutely fucked up on nineteenth century diseases. Getting yeah, TB to own the lips. <laughs> getting <laughs> ague. You have a yeah you, know, you, you you have like a hundred kinds of canned goods that can give you a hundred and fifty kinds of diseases. <laughs> you're eating you're eating ground beef, which may or may which is about I don't know ten to twenty percent Irish. Um, <laughs> oh, Ross. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But they hadn't. They, they, Sinclair Lewis hadn't written the Jungle yet, so no one knew about this shit. <laughs> so that's awful. One of the things is, I don't think anyone really came up with a, a conclusive idea of what happened until the science got better to determine why this bridge came down, right? And it wasn't just poor construction. It would have stayed up a lot longer had there, not, had, had there been better science at the time. So, we talked before about the angle blocks, right? Mm-hmm. So... This is the end angle block. We've got to focus on here, this connection right here. A couple things are going on right here. So we have our angle block, and I apologize that all these diagrams look different, even though they're describing the same thing. 
because no one seems to have a clear idea of what the actual dimensions of this thing were. Um, <laughs> Once again, refer you back to the as built rant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they they didn't have as built back then. So you can see you have the top cord up here that butts into the angle, the lug on the angle block. Now you can see that only two of the five I beams are in lugs, right? The other two are supposed to be continuous through each, or other three, excuse me, are continuous from, because this is a center angle block. Um, if you're at the center, you have a set of beams that goes two spans and another set of beams that goes two spans and they're offset, right? Except at the ends, right? Where they all terminate, right? Mm hmm in one angle block. Okay, and this is a problem. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's fine. I would simply build the angle block well. Oh. Oh yeah. Well, maybe if they did. So, the problem here is this last section of track doesn't have anything transferring the compressive force of the top cord into the abutment, right? It is all taken by the angle block, which is made of cast iron. Cast iron is very good in compression, so if there's another I-beam here, you know, this lug is only in compression. Because there isn't, this lug now has a moment force applied to it, as well as a shear force. So it's trying to sort of bend this way, right? Which means... This side is in tension, and this other side is in compression. So you start over a series of loading cycles to cause a microscopic fracture to form, which would eventually take out the angle block. And of course, this is the 1870s, and this whole bridge is very difficult to inspect because it's all underneath the actual... Uh, deck of the bridge. Hmm. And your non Pennsylvania didn't. railroad inspections at this point is a guy in a top hat shows up, looks at the bridge, and is like, Well, it's still up. Well, what's got to be? Right. Yeah, he, he probably didn't even Somebody have the My money. dad has inspected the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> he probably, probably, probably was not even a, a, a guy who could afford a top hat. You probably weren't paying him that much. Right? Oh, come on. You, oh, maybe he's got one of the, the hats the Haradim have, the, the fur Shabbat hats. I always wanted one of those, but then I'd have to hate women and have nine kids, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, just, I just always wanted one of the Shabazz hats. So, okay, so this, this problem could have, you know, probably kept going on for a very long time without causing a huge amount of problem. I mean, this is cast iron, right? So you need a very small fracture to, you need a very small crack to cause a total fracture. Right, but there was more problems. Which is the way this thing was cast, right? So there wasn't a huge amount of understanding about how you needed to cause have slow cooling when casting cast iron, right? So when they found this broken angle block, what they found was there was a large void inside the angle block right about here at the worst possible loading position for how they had designed how the I-beams work. This would be, again, trivial if there were a second I-beam on this side, <laughs> right? Okay. This acts as a stress razor, right? So all of the tension is concentrated in this area, right? You know, right, right about here, which means I need a much smaller fracture to cause the total failure of this angle block. Right, and you don't you don't have like inspection methods that could det detect this um, really for like thirty forty years after this accident, right? Uh, you'd need X rays or ultrasound or something to figure this out. I mean, one thing you could do is cast the thing properly. Obviously, they did not do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this uh, it was just real design flaws from what's his face, a massive stone. Caused and his brother's um yeah don't hire you know, your dipshit yeah. brother yeah no, exactly don't right don't hire your dipshit brother 
So, and again, the inspection methods, uh, you're using untrained people to inspect the thing. So they might, you know, look at a small crack, even if they could see it, which they probably couldn't. And they say, yeah, it's probably fine. It's only a little crack, right? You know, <laughs> so there was, um, there was not much, uh, not much, um, not much you could do about it, except again, if you, if you cooled this thing slowly, you know, one of the problems is if you just expose this to air, this lug cools a lot more quickly than the rest of the block, which is why that air bubble forms, right? So, you know, this, this is a predictable problem if you have more knowledge than they had at the time, right? And then there were further exacerbating circumstances that particular day. There was another train that went over that bridge 30 minutes before, and it was fine. Um, but, you know, that day it was very cold. That makes cast iron more brittle and not less. So, you know, it, it means you need a less, less of a crack to cause catastrophic failure. You have snow on the bridge that's adding extra load. Give you generally poor construction, which did not contribute. Uh, it didn't help, right? Mm. Yeah, because the diagonal braces are improperly fitted. Um, you know, you have all these shims. There's evidence that the shims sort of fell out over time. Oh, Lots of engineers mm -hmm. driving trains over the bridges reported hearing a bunch of snaps and pops as they drove their train over the bridge. That's terrific. So, yeah, indicating, you know, these members are crashing into each other, you know, moving around as the trains go over. So this was the one train which, you know, finally did it. So in the end, they replaced it with a wooden bridge. On the same abutments. Cool. So yeah, all of all of this was for nothing for the sake of yes. avoiding <laughs> uh, doing like four months worth of iron work or listening to any of the people that you hire to tell you how to build a bridge. So yes. Hmm. No, listen, I worked in Howie's office. I know how these bridges are built. <laughs> <laughs> And then I think this was later replaced. This was replaced with a concrete arch bridge, which stands till this day. Yeah, it's it's fine. Now covered in tree. Oh, well, tree There's goods. Lots of tree. Tree goods. Yeah, I, a tree is bad for structures. Oh, um, true. Yeah. Okay, there's only two passenger trains a day that go over this. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it's still, they're still using it? Hell yeah. yeah. Westbound Lakeshore Limited, eastbound Lakeshore Limited. When I thought, uh, new, when I said tree, uh, tree good, I thought they had like, this was like oh, fully overgrown, but... Uh, no, no, there's still four tracks on top. Fuck. There's just also trees for some reason. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure the, uh, I'm, I'm sure CSX is fine at inspecting. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah, that was the Ashtabula horror. Much less spooky um, than the name would lead you to believe. Well, maybe, maybe you should maybe, maybe you should listen to the people you hire to tell you to to have professional opinions rather than just going ahead with your own fucking moronic idiocy. <laughs> and then hiring mm -hmm. your dipshit brother to provide the materials. Mm -hmm. I believe also there was some evidence that the. Uh, the I beams which were supplied were undersized, like in terms of oh, like of the thickness were. of the material. <laughs> I don't know if that would have affected the final outcome, but <laughs> my God, yeah, I right. just I've, well, I have hired my cousin, the state's worst ironmonger. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know that means your your costs are are effectively zero. You know, it's, all the money stays in the family. Mm -hmm. Except the pittance you pay the workers. Yeah, and then uh, eventually yeah. you have to pay out some compensation, but that's years later. Yeah, exactly, right? F future cost, uh, future worth analysis means that's basically zero. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I took microeconomics. Um, anyway, so we, we have a section on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands with Dave. I'm just using that as the safety third, even though it doesn't say a safety third, it says uh, shake hands with danger. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's been the standard for a while. I don't know why you had to explain that. I don't know. Sometimes I like to I like to explain things to the people. 
Just re- no, just realized I was on the raw the wrong Wi Fi network this whole time, but I can't switch now. Classic. I've been on <laughs> oh yeah, I've been on Xfinity this whole time. Damn. Comcast strikes again. Bastards. All right. So anyway, today we have a, a safety third from a mine. Oh no. Yes. Oh boy. Yeah, that's why we have the MSHA logo up here because OSHA doesn't apply underground. <laughs> Yes, underground things are different. I, I think actually OSHA might apply on tunnels, but not on the mines. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the definition is. I have no idea. Well, if they had to merge them, then they would have to be OMSHA. So, all right. So, I was once, oh, excuse me. I once was a neutrino physicist. Okay. Like many neutrino experiments, the one I was working on was located underground in a mine to shield from cosmic rays. I know about these. These are cool as hell. They have to have these huge detectors that are incredibly sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. In the United States, to work in an underground mine, mandatory training is required. 40 hours for us. Even if you're not doing actual mining, right? Mm Mm-hmm. While this training involved many long coffee breaks and ancient VHS videos of miners with strange accents, it also emphasized two things relevant for this story. The first is mine ventilation. Air moves through a mine much like current through an electrical circuit. You need to know where the air is coming from and where it is going, because if there's a fire, You want to get fresh air as quickly as possible. Carbon monoxide is the biggest hazard because it preferentially bonds to your hemoglobin instead of oxygen. If you breathe too much of it, you die. Oh, good. And so the second item is how to wear the self-rescuer. It is so named because you are only supposed to use it to rescue yourself into fresh air and not, say, attempt to rescue downed comrades. Constantly a thing on ships, too. You hear about, like, oh, the fifth guy entered this confined space, but he brought the self-rescue and then it ran out and he died. (laughs) It's a fist-sized cartridge containing a chemical that converts poisonous carbon monoxide to relatively benign carbon dioxide, right? Once you break its seal, it starts working, and once it has been used, it cannot be reused. The training emphasizes that if you can smell smoke, there may be dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, which is odorless and invisible, and so you should don the self-rescuer. I was not personally present for the following events, but I heard about all of them and witnessed the consequences. One day, the evacuation alarm went off underground. My colleagues on shift hastened to the mine phone, which functions like a PA system, or can, and it announced, which announced a fire and its location. Consulting the ventilation map, they found there was no way for them to get to an egress shaft without passing through areas downwind of the fire. They started toward the nearest egress, and, smelling smoke, they opened and donned their self-rescuers. They made their way to the egress shaft, and upon arriving were promptly mocked by a large group of miners for wearing their (laughs) self-rescuers. What are you, gay or something? (laughs) (laughs) After waiting in line, they got their turn to go to the surface. There, they were further criticized in the lamp room, which issues lamps and self-rescuers and keeps track of who's underground, for wasting the self-rescuers. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> they cost a few hundred dollars apiece. My God, a few hundred dollars. It's a lot of money. That's almost an Xbox. <laughs> the colleague of mine who, who, who referred me to the story that was in the, the shift league tried to defend their actions. The subsequent argument was so exasperating that he refused to go underground ever again and lodged formal complaints with both the mine operator and MSHA. (laughs) 
has led to a general tension between us physicists and the miners. Not too long after they started storing tires and broken down mining equipment in the refuge area ne- nearest to our experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to kill these guys. <laughs> the rules. <laughs> This would be the place we'd go if we got trapped underground. It contained oxygen tanks and other supplies we'd need to survive if we couldn't get to the surface immediately. A fire there would have been a disaster for us as the next nearest refuge was over half a mile walk away. Despite my boss raising as much of a fuss as he could, the junk remained in place. Thankfully, it never did catch on fire, or at least... Not while our experiment was still running. (laughs) I just, uh, I'm the. What's the opposite of a safety culture? (laughs) I was about to say, yeah. No, they're 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 doing praxis. They they they, they, fuck these PNC physicists, (laughs) right? (laughs) Real working class people know that if you if there's a fire in a mine, you just die. No. Yeah, <laughs> it's the most the the more you're killed in a workplace accident, the more <laughs> the collar you the are. more working. Yeah, the more the more um, communist you are. That's right. <laughs> what did we learn? Scientists what are if, gay nerds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you f- fucking nerd. Why, why don't you <laughs> mine coal for a living? Yeah, yeah. why don't you, why don't you, you mine nerd? coal and mine die in a preventable accident? Dudes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did M do got, anything about this? I'm guessing no, not. Uh, no, okay. No, the, the junk stayed there, yeah. Awesome. Good lord. <laughs> Alright, well, I don't know how you, I, I, don't, I don't even know how you could get like a like a a lesson out of that at all. <laughs> That's just dumb. <laughs> Excellent story. All right. Um, well, having learned nothing mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I really basically made me, uh, you know, a, 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 I, yeah, no, well, I'm like Elizabeth Warren. Now these, these working class people deserve <laughs> nothing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, our next episode's on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster. Yep. Duh, duh, yep, we're going to do it. We're finally mm-hmm. going to do it. Um, I do have a commercial. Yes. Raising my mic like my hand just to... Oh, yeah, that's you know, true. You, you have a commercial. I got to yeah, do, do this. Have a commercial. <laughs> you got to do it. I do have a commercial. All right. So uh, a friend of a friend has a podcast on 90s and 2000s kids media. It is called And You're Watching. Uh, I've listened to a few episodes myself. They're pretty good. I understand that it's maybe not in the wheelhouse for this podcast, but I would suggest you go listen to it. It's it, Like I said, it's pretty decent. Uh, and we have shirts. We have shirts. Yeah, More shirts. importantly, we have shit. We have shirts that you can buy and a sticker with your money and a sticker that yes. we'll have to get we are getting more designs we are working on shipping to europe stop emailing me <laughs> yeah where's my fucking shirt yeah exactly uh we're gonna figure that out i was terrified to discover recently that there are now podcasts which review other podcasts oh no i know right mm-hmm. This is not. This is not the union. Don't culture. review us. Do Don't not review, review us. <laughs> do, do not review our. Don't podcast. be aware of our existence. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I always figured we could have more of a, a union culture here in podcasting, which is basically don't criticize the other man's work. But here we are. Although, uh, open call now, Sean KB. I know you're going to listen to this, hopefully to the end. And I just want to say, the next time we, co- we come up to New York to visit, we're, you and I are going to get in a boxing match. Not because <laughs> oh, you've done anything wrong, but because, because I kind of want to fight you. that's just how you are. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're, you're yeah, going yeah, fi- to fight Sean. You're going to fight yeah. Antifada, Sean. All yeah. right. I'm going to be anti anti I'm going to be anti anti Isn't that just Fada? Yeah, that's no, true. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, so that, means, that. That, means you're, uh, that means you're in the IDF. Yeah. So yeah, well, there people. are people. There are people on Twitter. And you know who you are. Who <laughs> yeah, me people of being keep a, saying it. Yeah, people yeah. accused me of being a Zionist. Which yeah, that, that's, that's wrong. Be fuck off. That, that's why your mic is so bad. Is because you broadcast from the inside of a Makava tank. Here I, yeah, here <laughs> I am, somewhere in the Negev, wishing I were somewhere else. <laughs> 
you could you could just just tag me if you're trying to fight just tag me i'd appreciate that as opposed to you specifically avoiding mentioning my name like i'm fucking Voldemort. i'm not we can discuss that like adults you dumb bitches Mm -hmm. i still haven't been permanently canceled by anyone i mean lamb's canceled because he's in the idf alice is canceled because she's a cop yeah a cop yeah um i i am i am free of sin still yeah, that's why you have a Twitter account still. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm I'm canceled right. for. Uh, Let's for, wrap this up so I can drive back to yeah. Philly. All right. Um. Well, that's that's the episode. Find a reason to cancel me. Um, do not I guess find I, a reason to cancel him. Oh uh, no, you should probably do it. I, I'd be entertaining. Um, yeah. All right. Anyway, that, I I would enjoy being canceled. I think it'd be fun. Uh, yeah. I I you know. Maybe we maybe we can get like uh, a bunch of like really weird people mad at me. Maybe I can become, I don't know. I could become the main guy on Twitter for a day. Um, That'd be fun, Roz. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, that's the podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, feed is in. How do I turn? All oh, right, I got to go through. And turn <laughs> How do I off. close PDF? Yes. yes.